I saw the gypsy woman and drank her rum and coke. You'll never be a dream, she said, till you go up in smoke. I saw the country doctor and I showed him my star. You're sick of rock and roll, he said. Haul out your old guitar. I'm walking on the clouds. I'm on the hook, all right. I'll kick you in the morning. Oh, love me up tonight. Folks, welcome inside the Paris C Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, The Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, The Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And um, serendipity reigns supreme again here on The Jake Feinberg Show because uh, yeah, I was putzing around and uh, just happened to connect with a, a bass player named Jim Fielder, um, who I... Um, I knew from blood, sweat, and tears, and we started to uh, communicate back and forth on Facebook. And he's like, "I'm going to be in." This is going back about a month. He's like, "I'm going to be in um, in, uh, in in Phoenix for uh, this gig with Neil Sadaka." And I said, "Hey, you know, I'd love to come up and do a Facebook Live interview with you." And as I'm doing research for this interview with him, I noticed that uh, he grew up in in high school or was in the same regional hotbed of artistic activity is Tim Buckley. And I noticed that it also mentioned this mercurial poet named Larry Beckett. And uh, as it turns out, as fate would have it, uh, Larry and Jim live in the same town. They don't necessarily hang all the time, but it put him on my radar. Next thing you know, I connected with Larry and I get a chance today to speak to somebody who was right there in the uh, in this incredible era of auditory learning, uh, print writing, and riffing from the greatest beat poets and merry pranksters, and uh, but this was more of a Southern California vibe. And uh, what an honor, Larry Beckett! Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks, Jake. Glad to be here. I, I you know, this may I won't. I just want to ask you straight up. Uh, I know you weren't like heavily involved in the music industry, but what were your intentions for getting into music? Yeah, well, before I was into music, I was writing poetry and concentrating on that. But then, uh, in the, in the mid sixties, um, Poetry started to invade music, thanks to Bob Dylan, and uh, the music itself started to rise to uh, classical levels, thanks to the Beatles. And it, it, uh, that had a powerful effect on us. So Tim uh, Buckley was singing folk songs in Hootenannies at high school, and I was writing poetry in a journal. And... Um, <laughs> Then, then, then I'm, you know, but we're both listening to Dylan and the Beatles, and I'm thinking, you know, we should write songs. We should write songs using poetry as the lyrics, and uh, and uh, and and uh, your own genius for melody. And uh, he said, okay. Um, can you talk about just because I was birthed in '78, I. I yeah, you, I mean, you're. I know Dylan. Uh, he was the first one to plug in. Uh, he had a trap set at Newport, and uh, you know, Lomax and him almost went to blows. But I mean, was he the single? Was he the single uh, icon for you guys? I mean, I just know that. No. Yeah. So I want you to break down some of the other cats that were, because Dylan, I mean. He's sort of in a in a no, pocket. He was in, he, he was uh, at, at the lead, you might say, and and wrote more complex poetry than anybody else. But we listened to other people like Donovan every single day, 
oh. and uh, Fred Neal and so on. Can you talk about Fred Neal, by the way? Because uh, Hugh Romney, <laughs> otherwise known as Wavy Gravy, was a big yeah. was a big Fred. Who? F- how did you come across Fred Neal? He was more of an East Coast cat. Uh, he was. Uh, actually, he was a nowhere cat because he was so <laughs> strung out on heroin that he didn't really a- appear very much. But uh, he he had the same manager as Tim. So I think that's... To... Uh, I guess the... The first album that really had an impact on us was the the Fred Neal album. Um, was it self-titled, or what, do you remember the name of the album? Yeah, I, it was self-titled. That the one with the dolphins on it. Oh, I gotta look this up. And um, and uh, actually, in 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 later years, both Tim and I realized that that was probably our favorite album of the '60s, including everybody, be, because of the. I mean, Fred Neal could write lyrics that were like American folk songs. You couldn't, they were indistinguishable. I mean, how, how amazing is that? And his voice also was better than anybody else at the blues or a ballad. So, um, and I, 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 I was interviewed for uh, some magazine about Fred Neal and said, it's the kind of blue of folk rock. That is. I love what I do. You are Beckett. You are the coolest cat. Or, uh, that is the sickest line. <laughs> I and the thing is, and it's because you can listen to it over and over. Both albums have the same quality. You can listen to them over and over. You can listen to Kind of Blue and then put it on again, and it's like you didn't just hear it. I, I well, I think that has something. To, I mean, I think I I think that has something to do with. Uh, Bill Evans, because I can do that with the Village Vanguard sessions too. I don't know what it is exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. But go ahead. Anyhow, uh, yeah. and I, you know, and this article was actually to the, the the most wonderful thing is that Fred Neal, in the following issue, wrote a little letter to the editor saying, "Wow, I didn't know people still listen to that stuff." So he actually read my quote and uh, was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me <laughs> because we we loved him uh, insanely. Um, looking here, uh, God, this is hard to hard to determine here. Sixty four, tear down the walls. Uh, wor- yeah, is that what it was? Or world of folk music? Uh, I, I, this is interesting. Uh, trying to determine. Yeah, he has a, he has one. Uh, well, he had a duo album that was fairly uh, freshman like, and then. And then a sophomore effort, <laughs> uh, you may say, uh, and uh, by that was solo. And then finally, for the Fred Neal came out. Uh, actually, Tim and I were at the session uh, for the Dolphins. For uh, okay, so you're saying this album. is for the Dolphins. I gotta look. I, so anyway, I want to go back to something. You, yeah. The, so the uh, yeah. The, t- the, so- the very song that Tim uh, became completely enamored of. Uh, 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 Tim's manager invited us to the session while Fred was recording it. So we went in. We only stayed in the recording booth for like 15 minutes. But it was completely amazing. <clears throat> they had John Sebastian in there on harp, and uh, and and the, the place was in a, a cavernous studio, completely dark. And Fred and his w- incredible sidemen, uh, including the guy from the MFQ and uh, they they did different takes. They did like four different takes of the dolphins. Each one, in each one, Fred completely reconceived the music. It was like they weren't polishing something. They were in the in the fires of invention. So that that, that was like an incredible lesson for for Tim and I about about the exploring possibilities instead of just uh, making something right. Cyrus Faryar, Faryar. Cyrus Faryar. Uh, yeah. From the MFQ. MFQ. A, a friend of mine because uh, I've written songs for the MFQ over the years. You, really? Yeah. I mean, this is fascinating to me. I, again, I want to go back. So, so, so you had a, po- a book, a bag of, of, of poetry. You had a book of poetry. Tim had a guitar and a wildly insane voice. Um, yeah. Explain again. 
at the time, no matter how naive or however, uh, what were your intentions for, for, for getting, for making music and getting into music? Yeah, what I'm, so, yeah. yeah I didn't really answer the question, now, did I? So, right. so the impetus was, was to uh, um, make music like the people that we loved, uh, make lyrics and music, but but our our intentions were simply uh, to create fine art. We weren't interested, and as a matter of fact, and uh, I'm not aware that either one of us in our entire ten year history together ever looked at the charts for sales of a. is the next work of art. Uh, I, I, I want to be clear. Some of this stuff was getting radio play. Were you hearing this stuff on yeah. the radio? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you guys were... And what is fine art? I want to know what that aesthetic is because what I'm getting at today is you have so many um, gadgets and pro tools and sort of this idea of uh, if somebody has a certain type of look, they can be in the studio and sing, and they'll say to the engineer, how did I sound? And he says, terrible, come up, we'll fix it. So there's this lack yeah. of authenticity. What did yeah. fine art mean? Did it mean having the drummer only playing on the top of the kit? Did it mean having ultra dynamics? Did it mean having being able to tell folkloric songs in plugged-in electric settings? What did fine art mean to Beckett and Buckley? Well... Um, in in an important way, it meant creating something new um, that had that we had n not done before, nor had anyone else. And then, really, the the aesthetic is um, to be working from inspiration and using all of our craft to to make something that's whole, harmonious, and radiant. <laughs> okay, can you give an example of when, how quickly, or any, or the earliest time that you did something groundbreaking that fit into all that criteria? Groundbreaking? Um, well, that's not really for me to say. I don't well, no, what you see, you know, no, but you know what it is. You just said you wanted to do something completely different than what had been done before. Yeah. So, give an example of what. Well, you, not completely different, but. You know, uh, individual. Let's say our our finest. You know, at the end of his life, uh, he, he and I were kicking around the idea of a, a quote greatest hits album that would be. Since there were no hits, <laughs> this would be a live performance of the songs that we loved the most that we'd written together. And and number one was "Song to the Siren," uh, which is really. Uh, as was pointed out to me in an article in the in the Guardian in England, it's become a, a standard. I mean, it's been recorded by like a hundred people every year. A couple more recordings. Of it's it. insane. You you go into YouTube, you type in "Song of the Siren," and yeah, it, it's hard to it's find. Everywhere. It's hard to find your version of it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's is like true. insane, you know. But I mean, so so at the time though, can you just talk about well, where did the, where did the lyrics of the, for that uh, come from and then ultimately what was revelatory to me is that you know I was out in on assignment in, in San Jose and I'm, I'm talking to and again you know Tower of Power nobody would would claim that Oakland Bay Funk was going on with psychedelic rock, folk rock of Tim Buckley but mm -hmm. what the drummer who took over for Tim for David Garibaldi said to me was he was always trying to figure out how the drummer was able to play to those horn parts uh, on the records, and what a term, what he, what he, what was revelatory to him was that, in fact, the horn arranger was arranging. It was the arrangements were built for the drum. Did so? My question is this: as far as the 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 architecture of the tune itself, how did you guys develop a groove on the tune, and then give a little bit of the backstory on? On the on the poetry. Okay, well, um, if you want, if you Google "Song to the Siren," one of the performances you'll see is by me. 
Right. Where I've I'm seen that doing, one. Uh, there's, there's, there's the, it's the, uh, uh, I, I do a live version with a, a British folk rock band from, uh, uh, called uh, uh, the Long Lost Band, and uh, that I did a whole album with actually. Uh, but one of the things we and I w- actually went over to England. And one of the things we did in concert was "Song to the Siren," my essay on how it came to be written. Uh, that will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, Well, I guess and, uh, more to the more more to the point. I mean, stepping back from it, at that time, um, how much yeah. did how much did did psychedelics and life experience play a role in your crafting of songs? Uh, not at all. And really, "Song to the Siren" was is really a riff on a a, a motif from Homer's Odyssey. Uh, so. Uh, really from a, a whole other direction and and when i tim and i had a sort of uh esp relationship uh that we noticed er, very early on and that is there was there was some kind of clairvoyant understanding between us we once came to a rehearsal of our band the bohemian he had brought a new melody. I had brought new lyrics, and they actually fit together. Wow. Then we looked at each other going, okay, well, this was fun up to now, but now we see that something <laughs> is going on that we need to we need to explore further. And so on Siren, I, j- I brought him, the, I, had, I had written the lyrics with almost no revisions. Uh, I still have the manuscript, and took it to him and he uh, just picked up his 12 string guitar and started singing it as you hear it it was it was and there were a few people around the breakfast table listening we we couldn't even believe it it was like he was making a couple of slight changes to a song that he'd written long ago i don't know how that happens but it did well, I guess more I want to play on this idea of telepathic because I mean once you're I mean yeah. once you're in a band for a long time, especially a, a band of melodic improvisation or just a band that tends to leave the head of the tune, you get better and better at that telepathy. Um yeah. and did that start in the Bohemians for you guys? I mean, did you have little things and then it just sort of culminated with Song of the Siren? Yes, absolutely. It was going on all along. Talking to Larry Beckett here on the Jake Feinberg Show. When I interviewed Crosby, um, this is moving ahead of just a couple of years, but they'd be playing the Sunset Strip, and Ginsburg and his partner would come in, and they'd dance all night to the birds. I mean, they were an active, the Beats, yeah. the Beats were an active member of all the music that sustains today, or that will sustain, that's going on today, that will sustain into the future has a story to tell, but it also came out of a community of culture. Um, can you talk about the the uh, the impact that cats like uh, Kerouac and and Ginsburg and yeah and Ferlinghetti did 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 you have exposed? I mean, did you have exposure to guys like Lord Buckley? Did you meet some of these guys? Did you ha- could you talk about a defining moment for you? I mean, you guys named your band the Bohemians. I mean, it's legendary. <laughs> this is legendary. Yeah, I named everything. I named the band the Bohemians. I love it. Um, so the thing is, well, 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 first I should I should definitely check in with you that there's a n- brand new book from Bloomsbury uh, Publishing in London called Kerouac on Record. It's like a 500 page book about the uh, the impact of uh, bop and other kinds of jazz on Kerouac's writing and then the impact he had on rockers like uh, Dylan and Van Morrison uh, and a, a really amazing book with a, a community of great scholars and I'm happy to say that they included my chapter on Jack Kerouac. Well, hold on. Okay, I want to be very uh, clear. I, I and I am all. I am a auditory learner. I've done thirty five hundred yeah. interviews. 
<laughs> and I'll get around to reading it. I want, I, but yeah. I, I live in, I want, can you just sort of, for the lay person, talk about the bop, the bop, the jagged bop angular stuff that, that affected his writing? I mean, this to me is where, where, where the rubber meets the road with authenticity. Yeah, that's right. And my, so I wrote a book called Beat Poetry. Um, oh, man, I got to buy, I got to get that for Hanukkah. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Um, and, uh, it's uh, it, it, I wrote it because there seemed to be a lot of books about the Beats who who were major early inspirations for me. Um, but they didn't. They always included, you know, they had to include de- prose and drugs and depravity, or they couldn't get published. So I thought, well, what the hell, you know, poetry is good enough for me. And all of these guys were great poets, including Kerouac. So I just wrote a book just on beat poetry and it includes complete poems with my essays showing where they came from and where they went um wow so and wow. The, the chapter on kerouac's uh jazz inflected poetry um and and so the the point is that Kerouac was he was literally hanging out with uh, Bird and Miles Davis and everybody uh, in New York City, and uh, uh, not to say Lee Konitz and Lenny Tristano also, and and uh, the uh, idea of a uh, somebody taking a solo he adapted to writing poetry. So he had these little note pads that would fit in his his uh, shirt pocket and uh when he wanted to write a poem he would pull out the pad take his pen and then just write it on that page so the solo was as long as as he could fit on the page and he would just improvise something that was the piece that was a new way of writing poetry well, and and b- b- before it was just sort of more of a formula trip. Sit down and yeah, um, that's right. It was it wasn't something that was a multi sensory kind of. Did he bring in the multi sensory component to poetry writing? He did. You know, if you, if you look uh, at if you look at his po- you can find his collected poetry in the Library of America actually. Um, and if you look, almost every single poem has a a sequence there, uh, some line or lines of nonsense syllables. That's like him scat singing uh, or bringing it around to pure music where it's just sounds. And uh, every every single poem just about has that sign. That is remarkable stuff. I, I You know, I just wanted to ask you your opinion about... Um, the word bebop itself was it coined by the poets no it i think it was i think there's a hampton hawes song hey bop a rebop and then the some somebody in new york a critic or a jazz man said you know let's just call it bop yeah because bird and dizzy didn't call it that you know, no. no. So I mean, it, it just you know that that's. I, I always want. I would cringe if I was a journalist at that time. They, and 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 uh, they talk all about it in Kerouac on record. So you can just read it right there. Um, they talk about the beginnings of Bob. So um, can you? But, ta- uh, yes, Allen Ginsberg. I have to say that I came to Kerouac later, uh, but it was Allen Ginsberg. Once I read Howl in the late fifties. Not when it first came out. I was pretty young. Uh, but when I was a teenager, I read Hal. And uh, at, at the, the next day, I started writing poetry every day. So that's the impact it had on me. <laughs> what, I mean, it's speci- I mean, maybe it's self-evident to you, but, I mean, you started, you became obsessed with it because all of a sudden you saw it as something that you, that, Maybe you didn't completely recognize that it was part of your true nature, but it was something that you could, re- you maybe found a purpose for yourself. Well, yeah, I, I, I actually have figured out over the years that I, I, I was 
what you call born a poet. Yep. Not made. And uh, so uh, you weren't a made. You weren't a made. You weren't a made man. Surreptitiously writing strange poetry, or you know, uh, or, or or stealing lines from this or that, and sticking them in a drawer. I'd been doing that for years. Actually, I had a revelation uh, when my English school teacher, a man named Bob Corfman, who literally changed my life, um, he had some assignment to to write and write something about this abstract painting uh, that he hung up in the front of the class. Well, I wrote a three-page prose poem in the style of Finnegan's Wake, and uh, so. So then, uh, and that <laughs> that gassed him so much that he started. He brought in people from I don't know important people from the the school district to hear me recite it and t- and talk about it. And then after that, he asked me, "So what are you going to be?" And I said, "Theoretical physicist." <laughs> and he, he just laughed. It was like a Zen laugh, you know, like, nah. No. no. Yeah, you were. He's no, like you were. You were a poet, yeah. man. Yeah, you were born you're a, a poet. poet. You're gonna be a poet. You're already a poet, and you're not gonna be a physicist. And I went, wow, how? Uh, the U.S. trying to outdo Russia technologically, and I thought, you know, if I become a theoretical physicist, they're just gonna try to use my genius to kill people. So exactly. I thought I would, be, I thought I would rebel against everything and be a poet, which I was already. Uh, thanks to uh, the revelation of, of my teacher. What it was the most looking back on it, people, you know, I've, as I started to sort of, you know, I've interviewed Maury Baker, Lee Underwood, uh, Fielder, yeah, good. Uh, yourself, actually, and and Lee Underwood was incredibly. Uh, um, uh, heaped praise on you and wanted to send a big right. hello to you because um, he hasn't right, connected with nice. you in a while. But, I mean, can you talk about the keys? Everybody has different working relationships. Garcia and Robert Hunter, uh, you know, all these yeah. wonderful singer-songwriters and players. Um, can you just talk about, uh, I, I guess, the, 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 the best way that you think – because some people want to take on every, a lot of people want to take on everything. They they want to do everything. They want to they want to play the music. They want to create the music. They want to they think they're good engineers. They do everything, and it's really not a very good system to do. You need you need to have a team, and I'm wondering about the qualities of as it relates to creating a song with melody, you know, in, yeah. in an electrified setting. What were the keys for you and Buckley? Okay, so. So there's composition and performance, and in in composition we're in that we're in that mode. Uh, of, well, Tim started wanting to assert himself as a lyricist, and that created a kind of a nice vibe on these albums, where the the lyrics are, are become unpredictable because you can't you're not ready for whether it's going to be me or him, <laughs> and it oscillates pretty wildly. Um, can you could, for, for then, the audience listening? Could you could you point to it? Not necessarily like a maybe a tune that when he got into songwriting that was uh, oscillating. Was that the word you used? Yeah. So if you go like from Pleasant Street to to Hallucinations, it's just a it's just it's a different feeling for language altogether wow. between the two. So. Um, but then the songs we wrote together were in that zone. We're in that telepathic zone where we were really comfortable. I always wrote the lyrics first, but I seem to have a gift for writing words that fit into what he was obsessed with melodically, like 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 hallucinations. Like he he came he he came up with an album of. Uh, like Moroccan street music or some damn thing that he was obsessed with and played some of it. And then I went away, not really thinking about that at all, but with obviously it was in the back of my mind. Then I wrote Hallucinations and gave him the lyrics, and then he wrote a, his own Moroccan street song to it. And the, and the lyrics seemed to fit perfectly with that uh, genre. 
So well, I mean, let's let's we just for really... the audience. I mean, you know, for the audience, we're talking to a legend. Like, let's let's cue up hallucinations, and then you can riff on it a little bit more. Okay, let's take a listen to it. All right. Saw you walking only yesterday. When I ran to catch you, you disappeared and the street was gray. The candle died, now you are gone. For the flame was too bright, now you are gone. you laughing with your laugh of gold when I called out to you silence returned and the air was cold the castle fell now you are gone and no more rings the bell now you are gone On the day it rained When I tore it open There in my hands only ash remained The castle fell Now you are gone And no one rings the bell Now you are gone No one was there and the night was deep The candle died, now you're gone For the flame was too bright Now you are Music on the Jake Feinberg Show, brought to you by Diggs Dental, Craig Pretzinger of Allstate Insurance, the Tucson Jewish Community Center of Southern Arizona, the Desert Heart Foundation, and its principal researcher, Dr. Ted Goldfinger, and my two newest sponsors, and one in Childs Valley, California, Green and Red Winery, and also in Napa Valley, the Robert Bialy Vineyards, and we thank them for their support so we can play tripped out tunes like hallucinations for the guy who wrote the lyrics for Tim Buckley, Larry Beckett, you nail, I mean that, that had that incredible sort of middle Eastern, yeah. uh, sort of, um, and so you're saying he, you, you brought him the lyrics and then he just slotted them right into this sort of groove that he had in his mind. That's right. And then, uh, in the studio to, to finish the answer to the question, uh, it was all about passion that he became known as Mr. First Take because he felt that reasonably that if you sang a song like five times, the fifth time was not going to have the fire of the first. So he tried, he did everything he could to just nail it the first time out. 
wasn't really a band leader. That was up to other musicians or the producer. But all he was meditating on was getting it the the true fire the first time. Right. I've heard that on I don't know a couple of people have told me where it's just like if you do do it the first time and if there's a mis- mistake second time at the most um uh is how the, the stuff uh should be portrayed. I mean like going back to this concept of fine art um I mean was it really just serendipity that 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 you guys got called up to go see the mothers and you wound up meeting Herb Cohn that night or were you there that night? And I mean, to yeah, me, it's, I was there. it's like, it's like, uh, I mean, it's almost incredible t- to, to even have people that had any kind of budgets that appealed to original song content or original song composition. And you're telling me that you guys, Buckley, et cetera, were not on his radar until that evening. That's correct. Um, so uh, we were, uh, we we knew we were onto something, and and so we spent every weekend uh, walking up and down the Sunset Strip, o- often with not enough money to go in the club. And uh, it just happened in, in a, I think it was December, uh, that the mothers were playing, and and Fielder had a connect. to the man who became Tim's manager. So, yeah. How, how, how when you finally got into the, but you guys cut a demo as the Bohemians. Is, has that seen the light of day? Because I would love to hear that. You know, we did, and it was just discovered this year. And it just came out on Record Store Day. It's called I Can't See You. Um, and it's from... Uh, uh, I think it's Light in the Attic. Is there's a vinyl version? There's going to be a a British uh, CD version coming out later this year with a, with an interview between me and Pat Thomas, and that is uh, yeah, that's the original Bohemians. Uh, three of my songs and uh, me playing drums too. You, really? I'm okay. I just want to be clear here. I'm looking up now. I can't see you. Is yeah. our there's there's several, there's an, a, a version available that says Tim Buckley on YouTube, but that's not the Bohemians one. You cut that as uh, him as a leader. Yes. Okay. That that was on the first album. What so. kind of what, how did Tim want the drums to be? I mean, this is so interesting to me. This 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 crossover between folk music, which is what Tim which is argue, ostensibly what you guys were doing, playing hoot nannies and things like that, where there really wasn't a trap set, uh, versus the drums coming in. I mean, by the 70s and 80s, the drums became the, this forefront instrument, pulsating double bass drums. You could barely hear anything. It kind of, whereas before, drums in jazz, drums in, in early folk rock, it was more of an accompanist instrument. Uh, did you? Uh, could you talk yeah, about more, more percussion? Yeah, well, I think Tim was always more interested in drums as percussion than as some driving force. Can you? Could you? Could you talk about drums as percussion in a ba- in a in an electric setting? Not really. I wasn't really uh, a trained drummer and didn't last very long as a drummer. So. So I'm not the one to talk. To. Well, no, but I, what I'm asking about is when you're cre- when creating a, a, a feel, a vibe off that first take in the studio, that feel. What kind of how did how did the drums come about as an accompanist instrument as opposed to a forefront instrument? That was, well, from my I can only speak to my own drum, and uh, that's that why was. you're on the program. I, I want you to speak to that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I don't. I'm not <laughs> talking was, to Philly Joe Jones. That was just my idea of of how to play the drums. Uh, 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 I even did insane things like that got me fired, uh, <laughs> like uh, losing the beat on purpose and then and slowly getting it back and things like that. The more creative approaches to drumming than anybody can handle. Um. Uh, 
that eventually got you fired, but that's something that Tim definitely got off on when you guys first started yeah. going to the studio? For sure. Yeah, we played lots of gigs as the Bohemians uh, and enjoyed them. Did you wind up uh, sharing the bills with with other bands like Kaleidoscope with David Lindley? Who 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 were you kind of being paired up with? Did you go on, I guess, not the Bohemians per se, but can you talk about some of these uh, bands that you were paired with uh, once you got a record contract and went out to promote the record? Well, that never happened. None of that ever happened. We were never paired with anybody. We played some, you know, high school uh, dances where they hated us because we would play Dylan songs. You couldn't really dance to them. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, once Tim got signed to the manager, the manager fired the band and said, uh, you know, it's bands are outre or passe and, <laughs> and and only only solo singers and from now on so so it was Tim that got the contract with Electra the band you know Fielder showed up for the sessions and actually Hartzler did for Goodbye and Hello for one song and and I was there every step of the way making sure they got the lyrics right and so on uh, and actually pl planning the music the the orchestration of goodbye and hello but uh it was tim's gig after that uh, so just to be clear the album is pressed and in yeah. some in, i mean goodbye and hello and then tim would be on a solo si solo singing tour Um, how did he feel about that? I mean, I, him being somewhat of a fine artist, I can't see him. He 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 didn't mind losing all the the mel melodies. He was just going out as a. Was he conflicted about that? About what? If I just heard you correctly, you made the album in the studio, but his tours to promote the album would just be just him by himself. No, sometimes he had the band with him. Which and the band and the band included you. No, no, there was no band. The band would be a touring band made up of whoever uh, he started to assemble uh, sets of live musicians that varied slightly through the years uh, to tour with. Um, maybe you can't answer this, but that seems somewhat odd that he wouldn't use the cats that were laying the tracks in the studio especially if he grew up with them that is true it is strange the whole the whole thing was strange <laughs> uh, <laughs> <coughs> yeah. excuse me so i want to be clear lowell george for instance would <coughs> excuse me he he would ev say everybody gets a piece of the pie if you contributed to a Little Feet song, everybody got credits. Everybody yeah. got writing credits. Um, how did that work? Uh, I mean, the the guy came in and said, uh, I forget who you mentioned, he, he fired the band. Um, were you given the appropriate, do you still re do you receive royalties for the songs that you crafted? Was, and, and what was Tim's philosophy as it related to giving credit? Yeah, he was completely fair about all that, and everybody got credit that needed it, and everybody got their royalties. Mm -hmm. And you st and you still and you still receive those today. I sure do. Mostly song to the siren. Right, but which like has for instance, in about six different movies too. So you get so you get uh, Hollywood uh, soundtracks are a big deal. So you get royalties for that. But also, sure do. Yeah. Uh, like for instance, uh, the the tune that that just got released on Record Store Day is that something that that you'll see uh, uh, royalties for? Absolutely. So, tell me a little bit about. Uh, I guess you're the perfect person to ask. Um, if if 
you clearly, if music was taken away from you, you know, would you, would you die spiritually? Or if, 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 if the arts were taken away from Larry Beckett, would you die? Yeah, you couldn't even really call it me if there was no art, no, no poetry and no music, either one. And actually, you know that that the, if I can answer a little more extensively, um, I have been at work since 1975. Um, I still see Tim in dreams that are not like my regular dreams, like I'm talking to his spirit. But since then, um, some amazing things have happened with me. Uh, one is that there's an album called Pass Your Light Around from Omnivore Recordings of the de- of of these kind of uh, uh, living room demos that were were cut by Jerry Esther, who was who is the guy who produced Goodbye and Hello and and wrote the all the orchestration. He and I uh, started writing songs together. Uh, after in a in a time where where Buckley wasn't receptive to the kind of poetry I was writing, mm-hmm. but Yester was, and really, quite frankly, uh, uh, m- m- many of the best songs I've ever written are on Pass Your Light Around. There's about ten of them. I can't write any better than that, and they're beautifully sung and produced. Something to check out, and then. Uh, well, can you? Can, I just this opinion. is my show. I, I do want. To, I'm not going to let you get away. I, I need you to talk about a, a dream, when Buckley came to visit you and, and you were talking <laughs> to his spirit, please. Because because I mean, you know what it is. When I interviewed Ralph Towner, he told the same thing about Colin Walcott, and the same thing goes on and on. They have dreams. So this is extremely important for people that are living in this formula trip society where they. What, yeah. where, wherever they believe, I mean, I, I really, if you could relay a specific uh, story of, of him visiting you, that would be great. Uh, it, it's hard to remember dreams. Um, I remember one where he was talking about, uh, you know, yeah, the, and I'm saying, I'm asking, you know, like, you got any new songs? And he said, yeah, there, I got a bunch of them that will be on my next album. And I'm saying, you know, you how can you have another album? You're dead. <laughs> you don't. They, those people don't put out albums. Right. And actually, I was wrong. He's put out like more albums, dead than alive. His estate has. His estate. <laughs> right. They keep surfacing. I mean, now, now the I can't see you demo is out there. So what can I say? Did I was clearly you, wrong. You know, I, 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 I oftentimes, uh, you know, when I talk to the cats, uh, the, they recognize that the music is coming through them from the heavens. It's not. Yes. And that, and that uh, a lot of the more disgruntled artists are ones that really believe that they're the ones that are doing it. And when they, they really just can't accept or understand that, in fact, it's a gift that they have and it's coming through them. And I was wondering if you could talk about it as related to uh, writing poetry, if the same thing existed as, you know, like you said, you, you wouldn't be anything without art. There would be no Larry Beckett, but did you get yeah, to that so, point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, actually Stravinsky said it best. He said, I am the vessel through which Le Sacre passed. And by Le Sacre, he means Le Sacre du Plantain, which is the rite of spring. I dig. I'm the vessel that, through which it passed, and I, I absolutely feel that um, that poetry is moving through me. I'm responsible for 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 putting it in the best language in English that I can, but that it's coming from somewhere else, and that I'm only the channel. When did that When did that really crystallize for you? I don't know, just slowly over the years did uh once I think once I read Stravinsky's quote I thought Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what is happening. I wait for inspiration. Well what what does that even mean? Right. And and Shakespeare said that 
near the end of his life, he said that poetry oozes out of me. And and I very much felt like that, like I'll just be sitting. Well, one day I was, like one of my most recent songs, um, which is uh, uh, called The Song. And uh, w- one of the best songs I've ever written and actually has been brilliantly sung by Stuart Anthony and is on an upcoming album called Love and Trial. No label, probably Bandcamp. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but I was reading, uh, I was reading, dutifully reading a, an anthology of American, modern American poetry, contemporary American poetry, and I was actually reading John Ashbery, uh, one of the poets I, I loathe perhaps the most of, my, of contemporary American poets, and I, I'm, I'm reading his crap, and then all of a sudden I, a verse springs into my mind stemming from from uh, uh, if I had wings like Noah's dove, that old slave song about about the slaves being torn up, their families being torn apart the way the president is doing to immigrants now. Sure, uh, it's a crime to take a child from its mother and father. That's a crime. That should be a crime. Anyhow, that this if I had wings like Noah's dove, I'd fly down the river to the one I love. You know what I'm saying? This really happened. That's what that song is about. And the the whole lyrics of that inspire, uh, inspired this lyric in my mind. A verse came, and I stopped for a second. I, I, I didn't think I was going to write any more songs. I thought I was done. And, and then... Um, and then another verse came, and then the whole song came, and I just wrote it down as though taking dictation. <laughs> I can't understand this process. I, it's a mystery. You still with us? Still with you. Okay, yeah, because we had to drop that. So it's still a mystery. Um, it's still a mystery, but it's real. Did, did I mean, it, what did it haunt? Did it haunt Tim at all? That did he struggle with this concept of things coming through him, uh, uh, being, or did, was he a subscriber in this, uh, uh, wanting you know, waiting for inspiration, or was it something that that? I mean, you guys weren't. I'm sorry, I I can't really speak to that. I I don't, I don't know that we ever talked about his his internal creative process. Did it get to a point though where he became? I mean, did I don't know? Did it did it affect him to become quote unquote? Like I I go back to my original question about your intentions for getting involved with art. art. Um, did it bother him that he became a star and that he couldn't really ever go out and? In public, I mean, did, did he start to feel? What were, what were the things that haunted him that you knew of? Well, if you are uh, need me to 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 be a conduit to him, you know that's unfortunate because you know his his death. Uh, he was my best friend when he died at twenty eight, and uh, and uh, it it hurt me really badly as a matter of fact i didn't even listen to his music i couldn't listen to his music for seven years after that Hmm. um i i do know that he if you if you met him right now if we could take you back to the 60s you would you would say this guy is heartbroken he's never going to recover and the you know his eventual suicide is not a surprise heart heartbroken he he had yeah. uh he was it ever to, was it ever uh, understood why he was or was it just a psychological makeup that he had well it's yeah it's it's complex his father had, had a was schizophrenic for example 
Um, and uh, there was a he had a self destructive side. Would after a gig would listen to negative criticism and reject positive criticism, mm. and then uh, eventually went on to. Uh, as you can read in uh, David Brown's biography, Dream Brother, uh, he went on to try to sabotage his own his own career in different ways, uh, like uh, in live performances, especially, but uh, also otherwise. So that, and he did finally succeed in destroying himself utterly. Right. Did you li- not? Did you? Did you? not listen to his music because you were upset with him? Yeah, no, I was grief-stricken. I yeah. couldn't I couldn't bear to hear his voice. Because it was something that you must have already I, I don't know. It, it, I I'm not saying it wasn't a surprise, but you saw this stuff coming down the pike. It couldn't have been I mean, you saw him you saw him sabotaging himself. Yeah. I did. Why did you decide to start listening to him again? Uh, I got a girlfriend, and I thought I would impress her by putting on these <laughs> old records. <laughs> yeah, the good usual. for you. Yeah, look uh, look you, at these songs I wrote. Yeah, check out these songs. Come on. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I mean, Larry, I, you know, when you have more time, I'd love to do part two with you. I really had a ball with you. We, we need to do part two because we haven't talked about what I've done since 75. I've spent... Uh, 47 years writing an epic poem in 10 books. Well, here's the deal. I'm going to be up in I'm going to be up in Portland uh, uh Really? Yeah, I'll very I'm on the road a lot doing Facebook live. So our second one post well, We could totally hang out in Portland. Oh, we're going to hang, man. Because I mean, we're going All to right. I'm going down to see um the the remaining merry pranksters in Eugene, but I'll, I'm going to be in I'll be in Portland for a few days, so we'll, we'll connect when I'm coming out there and okay. we'll, we'll do part 2. Okay. And, and uh, I'll get you a copy of this. I'll put this up on my website, and uh, we'll be blasting out transcripts, transcriptions of this epic interview later today. And Larry Beckett, thank you for taking the time and keep in, keep inspiring, my man. Okay, thank you. All right now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Amazing poet and songwriter and uh, musician Larry Beckett. Uh, we will be back with Amanda Fielding in about 15 minutes on the Jake Feinberg Show. Still then, peace.
Thank you.